Welcome to Napava Coffee House, presented by Napava, the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, in collaboration with the Harvard Law School Center on the Legal Profession. My name is Genevieve Antono. I am in the Harvard Law School class of 2022, and I'm absolutely delighted to be producing uh, Napava Coffee House as part of my student fellowship project with the Harvard Law School Center on the Legal Profession. In today's episode, episode two, you will hear uh, a one-on-one -on -one conversation between our host, Larry Tu, and our guest, uh, John Chu, who is the special advisor to the chairman and CEO at Amerisource Bergen. Amerisource Bergen is one of the top 10 companies in the Fortune 500, and it is one of the largest uh, global pharmaceutical uh, sourcing and distribution services companies. So imagine programs and services in the uh, pharmaceutical supply chain connecting uh, health healthcare providers and uh, biotech and pharmaceutical manufacturers on the one hand uh, to patients who need access to those products on the other hand. John and Larry are some of the most prominent and respected lawyers and C-suite executives in corporate America. Um, as I just mentioned, John is the special advisor to the chairman and CEO at a Fortune Top 10 company, and he used to serve as their chief legal officer. And many of you are familiar with the host of our show, Larry Tu, uh, who retired from CBS Corporation in 2020, but before that was the chief legal officer at CBS, the GC at Dell, the GC uh, at NBC Universal, the GC for the APAC region, uh, for Goldman Sachs, you know, partner at a major law firm, and so, so much more. One of the goals of Napaba Coffee House is to serve as a resource to a wide range of people. So whether that is, you know, the in-house counsel who is in the pipeline line to becoming a GC or the law and pre-law student who's just starting out their careers. And I will be honest, behind the scenes here at Napaba Coffee House, sometimes uh, we wonder whether uh, some of our guests are so successful that they will seem a bit too far away uh, from the most junior members of our audience. But as I was uh, reviewing this interview and I'm recording this uh, intro after the fact, I realized that there's actually a lot that a very junior person like myself has to learn uh, from this interview. So I will share two of my takeaways with you. First, Larry and John are very self-aware. Um, they're very humble and they have a learner's mindset. And over the course of this interview, you will hear them say things like, ah, yes, I used to make this mistake a lot more when I was younger, I'm better at it now, but once in a while I still, you know, struggle with it. And I think that this is a really great lesson for very junior people, for law students to learn. Because if these very successful C-suite executives can say, ah, yes, I am still learning, I am still growing, uh, what more for us, right? We don't have to pretend that we're perfect and we have it all together. We can be a lot more uh, transparent about the fact that we are still learning and growing. And second, even though Larry and John are very humble, that's not the same thing as underplaying your own talents and achievements. So over the course of this interview, you will uh, find that they're both uh, very confident in a very understated way uh, in what they bring to the table. So you will hear things like, oh, even when I was a junior associate, uh, I didn't like uh, to do things without knowing the why or people respected me because I didn't hesitate to you know, call out a lack of common sense. And I think this is something that um, maybe women and especially people who uh, struggle with imposter syndrome uh, can learn from because they're such great models for showing us that, yes, you can be confident and humble. And yes, you can be confident uh, and have a learner's mindset. Those were some of my takeaways and we want to hear what some of your takeaways are. So please leave a comment below or uh, leave a comment on our LinkedIn page at linkedin.com slash company slash Napava Coffee House. All right, without further ado, here is Larry and John. So John, thank you for joining our coffee house sessions. Uh, you and I have gotten to know each other over the years through various Napaba events. You have an amazing and distinguished legal career. And so I want to thank you for spending time with us today. Um, so why don't we start really at the very beginning. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your parents, uh, your, where you grew up, early schooling, just to give us a, paint that picture for us and give us a flavor of your early uh, years in life before law school. Sure. Uh, well, my Parents uh, came to the U.S. right after World War II, 
uh, from China. They were um, each from wealthy and fairly prominent families in China. Um, and at, at that time, right after World War II, um, the government or different provincial governments were sending students uh, to study in the US to study subjects like engineering or other technical subjects with the idea that they would eventually return to China to help rebuild the country uh, post-World War II. Um, it, in the case of my parents, and, and actually a lot of uh, folks um, similarly situated, they were sent to um, state universities in the Midwest. So my parents actually ended up um, at the University of Minnesota, um, and they actually, they met there. They were from different parts of China. Uh, my mother was from Beijing, and my father was from uh, a southwestern province, province Yunnan province. Um, there were a number of Chinese students there, um, all uh, sent by the government, and um, that's where they met. Um, so is that they, where you grew up in Minnesota? Is that where I, to... I, I didn't. They yeah. um, so they they were in Minnesota. Um, this was in the in the late forties, um, and um, they they planned to go back to China. Um, in 1949, the communist revolution uh, took place um, and a lot of the Chinese students who were in the US decided to stay and sort of see what was happening um, because they were hearing from their families at home, um, you know, that things were not uh, great for um, people from wealthy families. Um, and so a lot of them just stayed sort of waiting to see um, what would happen. Um, and then actually, interestingly, um, the McCarthy era um, took place. And at, at um, one point in the 50s, early 50s, um, it was not possible for them to go back. Um, and eventually, they decided to stay um, in the US. They, they moved to New York. Um, and that's, that's where I was born, in New York. Um, and I grew up in, in New York and Queens initially, um, and then eventually in a uh, northern New Jersey suburb, Bergen County, called Teaneck. And I was sort of thinking in preparation for this um, conversation with you, um, you know, thinking back um, that I actually, when I think about it, had a pretty, um, pretty, pretty comfortable um, growing up. You know, I was, I was lucky. I grew up in a town that um, had a very um, sophisticated population. There were a lot of uh, Jewish families. Um, where one or another parent was an academic at a university um, in New York or in, in New Jersey. Um, and, and so, um, you know, for someone who was um, um, being driven by my parents to be very studious, you know, it was sort of an environment where I was okay. I, it was okay to be, it was okay to be smart. Um, and, so you were uh, surrounded okay by smart, do, well, studious people driven by similar parents. Yeah, well, probably my parents were more extreme than others, but um, you know, definitely an achievement-oriented, um, academically oriented um, suburb. So, yeah. so that you know, I, I think back if I had moved to a place where um, you know the football team was um, was the key to to life in in school, um, it potentially would have been a very different existence but um or maybe you would have been the starring tight end on the football team who knows i mean i wouldn't rule that out who knows right? that could be you know it's interesting because you, your family's history is so similar to mine mm -hmm. i mean with a few very few changes mm -hmm. uh, e even the time period is so similar in terms of when my parents come over it's just remarkable that we many of us have quite similar backgrounds i mean not every not all of us do but many of us have overlapping backgrounds yeah, i think a lot i actually think a lot of us um, of especially of Chinese descent um, who um, are of of sort of this age mid mid sixties um, have do have a very similar background. Yeah. So that's sort of that group of Chinese who came to the U.S. post World War II was very similar. So I'm going to skip ahead to college because I know you and I chatted before we did this. Your college major was biochemistry. And to, to me, that means that screams pre-med. All of my mm -hmm. friends in college were who studied bio, major there uh, in, in, in biochemistry, went to med school. Uh, I was not smart enough to take biochem, so I, I, I took a different path. Um, so my question for you was, what happened to you on the way to medical school? How did you get detoured? 
Yeah, um, it's actually um, sort of a circuitous story, but um, I um, actually was really pushed into biochemistry, and and I've actually um, heard um, other other people um, describe sort of similar situations with with parental pressure, and and it's definitely a theme in my life, um, responding to parental pressure and. Um, you know, trying to fight against it to some degree, but not, not, not totally. Um, when I was, when I started um, college, what I really wanted to do was major in English, um, because at the time I thought I wanted to be a, a writer, um, a creative writer, actually, that was, was my dream. Um, and um, in the summer between my freshman and sophomore year, um, I announced, pronounced to my parents that I was going to um, major in English and you know, they had sort of a, a meltdown. Um, so all hell broke loose. It was basically a summer of <laughs> summer of lecturing about how there are no jobs if you uh, major in English. And they actually enlisted um, their friends to to um, to lecture at me. And you know, ultimately, I just um, after a summer of of um, constant haranguing, I ended up um, um, caving in, and I ended up um, majoring in biochemistry, but um, I sort of ended up just doing the minimum that I could do to get um, to fulfill the requirements and took a lot of literature. Um, and then ultimately, um, in my senior year, I was um, fortunate to get a fellowship, a traveling fellowship that um, in the fall that allowed me to um, travel post college. And so at that point, I decided to um, not take the MCATs and um, with the idea that, well, I've got this fellowship, so um, I can do other things. You should still, you should still be proud of me. <laughs> so you had to leave the country to avoid taking the MCATs. Exactly. That's what it comes down to. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And then you got a job, I think, as an as a copy editor at Asia Week, um, which was, I guess, sort of aligned with your writing interests, although not maybe creative writing. And then you were a loan officer at a bank before you yeah. ended up in law school. So yeah. was that something else you tried out? Well, I, um, I, I went overseas. I was a year in the Philippines and then um, spent a year in Hong Kong working um, as, as a journalist for a magazine there uh, as, a, as a copy editor. Um, and um, I ended up, um, I, I really loved the experience. It was actually the first time I'd ever been um, in a situation where um, you know, where I was part of the majority. So that was actually, for me, a really interesting experience, having always been in situations where, um, um, you know, I was part of a very small group um, you know, at the time that we were in college, as you will recall. I mean, there were very, very few um, Asian Americans in, in college at, at the time. Um, so for me, it was a great experience. And I, I actually I wanted to stay, but then I've Felt like I needed to get back, um, get back to the U.S. So I came back. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was looking for newspaper jobs, um, but at the time, it's sort of it's interesting to think about now when um, not that many people actually want to work for a newspaper. It's not yeah. it's not necessarily the most um, um, a, a career that has great prospects. Um, but at the time it was very, very competitive and hard to do. Um, so, um, I was, didn't really have a clear view and I ended up getting into a bank training program, uh, for what was uh, then chemical bank, which subsequently, um, merged with Chase Manhattan bank and eventually with JP Morgan. So it was sort of the precursor to JP Morgan. Um, and I started doing that. I actually liked it. I liked numbers. I'm good at numbers. Um, it was international banking. It seemed um, pretty interesting, um, but um, my parents were, again, entered into the fray and were very worked <laughs> up because they said, well, you know, how can you, um, you can't just go through life with just a, a college degree. You know, no one, no one, um, um, no one will respect you if, you if you don't have a higher degree. You have to have a higher degree, um, you know. If you if you want to get married, um, you know people only like um, families only want uh, their their son in law to have 
some sort of a D, they would joke, you know, you have to have a PhD or an MD, you have to have some sort of D. How can you just how can you how can you function without Oh, I thought they made I thought they made like a grade D in a class or something. <laughs> <laughs> that I should have I should have responded that way exactly. Um, but um, you know, ultimately, um, again, sort of months and months of pressuring, you've got to do something, you've got to do something. So um, I ended up um, taking the LSATs uh, because um, I read articles that said, well, if you don't really know what you want to do, if you want sort of to have flexibility to do anything, then um, go to law school. And that, um, so that's so sort of so how I ended of, up in law school. You sort of backed your way into law school almost as a compromise concession. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then lo and behold, you end up being general counsel of a major corporation, you know, for many, many years, uh, a stellar, successful career. So um, tell us a little bit about the role that you're in and that you're on the, in the middle of transitioning from. Yeah, so I've been the um, either the general counsel or the chief legal officer of a company called Amerisource Bergen, which is a, a large pharmaceutical distribution and services company. Um, I've been with the company since 2002 and the um, general counsel or chief legal officer since 2007. Um, in September of, uh, of last year of 2021, um, I um, started a planned succession. And so I passed on the chief legal officer role to uh, someone who I had been uh, developing uh, to take over from me. And that was really great to see her uh, step into the role. Um, and then I agreed to stay on for a number of months to help with her transition. Um, we had also just completed a large European acquisition. Uh, so I agreed to stay on to help uh, manage the European legal team uh, for a period of time and help uh, with integration activities. So I'm doing that now. Um, it's been a lot of fun to do to get to know a new group of folks. Um, I have to get up very early in the morning to have calls um, on European time, but um, aside from that, it's it's been great, um, and uh, I'll be doing that through um, through the end of April or so. Um, That's and great. Then, yeah. uh, I'll be off to retirement, which I'm also looking forward to. Well, I want to come back in a minute to um, your incredibly long tenure at the company, which is uh, somewhat unusual, but certainly not 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 uh, completely atypical. But it's a it's an interesting uh, career path, and I want to talk more about that later. But before we do that, um, after law school, you went to law firms um, mm -hmm. for a couple of stints, and then from and you and from there you went you took your first in house role and did that for a bit, and then went back to law practice before you landed in, in the current role that you're in or the the company that you're with. Um, so tell me about um, what stands out about those early years as an associate. Um, what, what do you recall about that? You know, good and bad. Yeah, I I. I think what I recall is that um, I really um, disliked being an associate at a law firm. Um, you know, I worked for large um, New York and Philadelphia law firms. Um, I think that there's a part of me that um, doesn't like um, doesn't like to be told what to do um, for irrational reasons. So, you know, when you think about the culture of um, Law firm. Did it, did it remind that, you of your? Did it remind you of your parents? It, it definitely <laughs> reminded me of my parents. You know, you have to be here at Saturday morning. Well, why? Because um, I'm someone who's always asking why and sort of questioning things. Um, no reason why. You just have to be there um, um, because we want you to. And just wait until until we get there and we'll tell you what to do. Um, so I think the overall environment to me was not. Um, um, didn't really take into account uh, the fact that um, you know people are smart, people should contribute, and that um, in some ways how you lead a group, um, you know, you should um, instead of ordering people what to do, you should be um, trying to explain to them why why they're why they need to do what they need to do and why um, um, you know why it's why it's important to do X, Y, or Z. So. In some ways, that experience actually really influenced um, how I think about leadership, because for me, at least, the experience was just um, very hierarchical, do what you're told, don't question. And from my standpoint, that just 
is not necessarily the best way to get, certainly wasn't the best way to get um, the best out of me. And, and from my standpoint, I, I think that's something that I've always reacted against a little bit um, as, as I went forward into the future. So um, it was a short period of time, but I think in some ways, in a weirdly um, reactive way, it, it really was influential in how I think about leadership because it sort of represented exactly what I um, didn't want to do and yeah. what I tried to avoid in my, in my own style. Now, from there, you, you had a couple of in-house roles at two major corporations, um, including a stint, I think, um, overseas again, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, did you find uh, that in those contexts, um, this issue of hierarchy and kind of being ordered around and not being given explanations for or reasons for doing X, Y, or Z, was that all that different necessarily? I mean, I mean, is there such a huge contrast necessarily between in-house environments and law firms on that issue? I, I think it depends on the culture of the company. Um, yeah. I, but I think um, that, um, you know, I found that um, maybe because um, law in, in a company is, is a support function. So you're not generating the profits, you know, you're having to do um, what needs to be done to help, help the business get done. Um, in, in some ways, it doesn't lend itself quite as much to a, to a situation where the leaders in the legal department can just, you know, dictate to people what to do. Um, I mean, typically, as, as I think all of us who have led legal departments experience, we're generally short staffed just because um, we're a cost center. And so we have to be um, pragmatic in what we have our people do and how we have them u- utilize their, um, their, their time. Um, I think that the, um, the one thing that um, I did carry over was that, um, you know, I was always someone who um, liked, liked people who had common sense. And if people didn't exercise common sense, I was sort of the one who behind the scenes would be calling it out. And um, for whatever reason, that seemed to be something that um, attracted people to me, that they, you know, they felt comfortable with someone who was confident enough to sort of call out, um, you know, people acting like jerks or calling out people that um, were um, behaving in ways that didn't make any sense or someone who was willing ultimately to just ask questions that seemed stupid, um, but actually were not that stupid because actually sometimes the person uh, making the comment didn't really know what they were talking about. Now, let's dwell on that for a minute, because I think you've said to me in other conversations that um, you view yourself as a nonconformist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, is this part of what you mean that you sort of ask, you probe, you don't necessarily take things at face value? I think I think that's definitely part of it. I think um, I think that I've always um, had this desire to be a bit of a rebel. But the reality, I think the reality is that that's not true. Um, the reality is that I've always ended up to some degree conforming. Um, but I think in some ways that tension is, um, is useful because for, as, a, as a lawyer, um, in that um, you know, I'm rebellious enough to want to call things out and challenge things. But ultimately also as a lawyer, um, you know, you've got to make sure that things get done. You've got to be um, pretty diligent. So um, I think actually in a, in a, I was sort of thinking about this um, again before our conversation that in a, in a peculiar way, um, it's sort of um, helpful um, for a lawyer to have a little bit of both. Um, but again, you know, that's one of those things you, um, your idea of yourself and the reality sometimes is um, a little bit um, differentiated. And so I, I like, I always like to think of myself as a rebel, but again, when I think about it, I probably haven't been ultimately that rebellious. Um, well, a rebel wearing that. the wearing the robes of a, of a corporate general counsel. <laughs> exactly. I, I like, there I you like go. that. I like there that. you go. There you well, go. So what, what I find curious is that in the next phase of, of uh, your career, you went back to a law firm. Um, and so now uh, instead of being an associate, you are commanding an army of associates. 
So how did the law firm world look differently to you from that vantage point? Or did it? It, it definitely looked a lot different to me. Um, I think one thing I hadn't realized as an associate is the pressure that partners have to, to market and to bring, bring in business. Um, and um, I, I actually, um, over the years, liked the technical part of lawyering. I liked the challenges um, that came with different problems that lawyers have to deal with. Um, but um, I definitely found that I didn't enjoy um, the marketing aspects. And um, as a partner in a law firm, um, marketing is a constant. You just have to be out there um, trying to get the business um, because as a partner, um, that's part of your role, that's part of your job. And if you're going to have any influence um, and meaningful role within a firm, um, at least from my standpoint, the last thing you want to do is sort of be a, I call it a working partner, you know, which is, which is fine. There are some excellent working partners, but um, you, know, you want to be able to control your destiny. And to do that, you really have to bring in business and, um, and, have, and have a book of business. And to do that um, means that not only are you working, but in all of your off hours, you're spending time um, marketing and pitching and just trying to um, bring in business. And you never know the next day um, when you finish a project, you know, where's, where's your next project going to come from? So it's, um, I think it's actually a pretty tough existence and it gives, gave me a lot of um, um, appreciation, I think, for what lawyers in law firms have to do. So let's fast forward to your Amerisaurus Bergen uh, role. You, you, I think you went to the company in 02 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then after four or five years, became the general counsel. And, and you stayed in that role for 15 years or so. And you're, you're still in the role today. Um, I imagine being general counsel is a very different role than either being an associate in a law firm or even being a partner, being a partner. Um, and I'm curious as you look at the role and as you grew into it over the years, what parts of it came naturally to you and what parts of it you might've actually struggled with and had to work harder at to be successful? That's a, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, I think, I think for me, um, a lot of the um, activities that a general counsel has to do um, came pretty comfortably to me. Um, I think one of the main things, a general counsel needs to do is also be um, a business executive, um, as well as a, as well as a, as well as a lawyer. And um, since it was never really my dream to be a lawyer, um, you know, I really liked doing other things. Um, becoming the general counsel um, was was a way for me to expand um, what I was able to do and expand um, my activities beyond just purely legal. Um, areas of activity. Um, so I was able to be very involved in strategy, be very involved in um, critical business issues that, that came up. Um, and actually during the course of my career, I um, took on different roles, um, I think in part because I just was interested in a variety of areas. So at various times I had uh, the strategy group under me, I had the IT group under mm -hmm. me, uh, a couple of couple of times, um, which it's fairly unusual for IT to be under the general counsel. Usually, it's um, if it's under an executive, it's usually under the CFO or some um, executive that sort of that sort. But um, I I was just interested in a lot of areas. I um, developed a reputation where people didn't think of me as just a lawyer, um, and for me that was good. It was um, gave me. Um, the chance to expand my horizons, the chance to um, do do a lot of a lot of things. So, John, let me let me let me interject there for a second because earlier we were talking about um, your stint as a law firm partner. One of the things you said was that the marketing part of it wasn't necessarily your your favorite cup of tea, but you really like the technical aspects of being mm -hmm. a lawyer. But it sounds like in this G, in the GC role, that becomes less and less a part of your day. Yeah. So, yeah. In some respects, you were moving away from the thing that you're like the best about law practice. And, and so talk about that, because yeah. clearly yeah. there were other things that were filling up your time and and it required broader skills than just being a technically competent or even proficient lawyer. I should say that um, 
I think as as a as a lawyer, um, I've I've always thought it was important to be um, a technically uh, sound lawyer. I think it's helpful, even as even as a general counsel, you know, to um, have a good grounding technically to be technically competent. Um, you know, that being said, um, from just a personal interest standpoint, um, I'm interested in law, but I've always been interested in a lot of other areas and um, strategy and business are definitely um, areas that I've always been interested in. So um, I would distinguish that from marketing because to me, marketing is sort of, you know, I, I've never honestly been someone who um, I think could be a great salesperson in the sense of going out and just, you know, calling on people and, and asking for um, for, for their business, but I, but I am someone who can go out and engage with people um, in conversations about business, about um, about what they do, and try to understand um, what they do, and um, and um, you know help them um, help direct them um, yeah. in, in a useful way. But but let me let me probe on that a little bit because it seems to me that part of your success in the career that you've had also involves selling yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I know that's a different kind of sales activity, yeah. but you're yeah. still having to pitch yourself and put yourself forward and, you know, deal with tough situations and tough colleagues. Um, and so talk about that part of the kind of recipe for success. How do you, how do you sell, sell and promote yourself into yeah. these roles? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think in order to um, rise up in any organization, I mean, it's true of a law firm too, but in a, in a corporate setting, um, you know, you have to have good interpersonal skills. I think, um, I think that I've always had, um, good interpersonal skills. Maybe it was because just growing up, I always, um, wanted to try to fit in. Um, you know, I never wanted to stand out. I think that's probably, um, an emotion that a lot of, um, you know, Asian Americans generally have growing up. Th th this, is even though, this is even though you are a nonconformist. Even though I was a nonconformist. <laughs> but I, exactly. See, I'm very contradictory. So you're yes. catching me in all the contradictions. You know, I think having good interpersonal skills is critical. Um, I think that um, networking is really critical um, and sort of gaining advocates um, for, for you and for your career is critical. Um, I think one thing that I've um, that's been really important to me is um, to network um, sort of without regard to hierarchy. So I have in my network, you know, I have people who are very senior, but I also have people who are in the ranks um, at various levels, because um, what I've found is that um, you really need people at all levels to help you. Um, you know, people are giving you information um, and that can be helpful. People are advocating for your career, and that can be helpful. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, I, I, I have, um, I'll call it a shtick, where um, I like to think of myself as being someone who doesn't like to toot my own horn. But on the other hand, um, um, I was actually thinking about that also ahead of this conversation. And I think that's, that's one of these mythologies that I tell myself, but ultimately, I'm also um, out there pitching myself. It's just that part of my pitch is that I'm not pitching myself. Clearly, you found a way to toot your horn without tooting it in a way that yeah. you, that uh, you might not have found appealing, but uh, yeah. it was nonetheless very effective. I think that's absolutely right, and I think I think it it's definitely something that um, you know people people coming up um, need to think about. You know how do you how do you how do you toot your own horn? Um, how do you build your reputation um, and your sort of your advo advocates for your you and your career? And, and, but you've got to do it in a way that you feel comfortable. I want to go to part B, my question, so, which is, so what parts of being a general counsel did not come easily to you that you even struggled with from time to time and had to learn, you know, kind of skills or learn uh, how to break, you know, old habits that might not have been the most productive to become more effective? delegation, um, delegating well, I would say. Um, I think that um, 
I tend to um, have strong views about how things should be done. And it definitely took me a while um, to reach the point where I felt um, comfortable letting go and, and sort of um, acknowledging that first, that different people are gonna do things different ways, that there's no necessarily one right way to do something. And that, you know, if people substantively are doing things right, the fact that they might do not um, proceed along exactly the way I would do it um, also is fine because different people are different and need to move forward in different ways and need to manage um, people and manage projects in different ways. And um, just because it's different from how I would do it, you know, I shouldn't be uncomfortable. I need to allow people um, to be, to allow people to develop. You really have to have confidence, show them that you have confidence um, if they're getting things done um, and allow them to do it in their, in their own way. Yeah, as you look back, um, I mean, did you think, were, were there situations where on that issue you made mistakes uh, earlier in your career that you, you learned from? Because I certainly did, and I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think many of us uh, have the tendency, especially earlier in our careers, to, to micromanage other people yeah. too much. Yeah, and yeah. It takes a while to figure that out and to even, even to realize that about yourself. Yeah, no, I, I think definitely so. We're exactly micromanaging is the, it's the perfect word for it and sort of jumping in um, in a way that just um, um, demotivates people. And, you know, I definitely um, have done that um, in especially, you know, early on. Um, and, you know, it's not good on two fronts. It demotivates the person. And then you basically are pulling work onto your plate because basically you've sort of said, well, I'm going to do it because I've got to do it this way. And it's it's actually the worst of all possible worlds. I mean, do you find, John, that on, on things like that, where we have certain natural tendencies that may not be the most helpful, um, that we sort of have a natural default setting and that we will relapse? <laughs> and you got to remind yourself over and over again these lessons that are learned, but it, you never completely escape from it. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think, I think, you've, I think self-awareness is very important. I think knowing your strengths and weaknesses, knowing your tendencies, like you say, and then, you know, constantly thinking about it. But it doesn't mean you don't relapse. I mean, even, 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 even now, as I'm approaching retirement, I still relapse, you know, from time to time. And it's, and, and it's hard, um, you know, to sometimes to control yourself, because I think when you're, when, when things get um, um, under pressure, um, you know, that's when you especially have to sort of force yourself to step back and make sure you're not, um, not doing things that are um, not beneficial for the team. Well, John, I'm going to um, throw a couple of uh, propositions at you, and I want you to react to them, yes or no, or agree or disagree, and we could, we could talk about them briefly, and then I think we'll be close to finishing. So what do you think about this statement? To be an effective GC you have to work to become the smartest person in the room. That I definitely disagree. So, so why do you disagree? I, I think that that goes, that goes to this issue of micromanaging and, and demotivating. I think what I found over time is that um, it's, it's actually um, great to have smarter people than you um, on your team. I mean, and you really hope that you have smarter people on the team. I think that the person in charge, this is just my own personal view, needs to be smart enough. You need to understand. Um, you need to be able to understand what's going on and understand what people are explaining. But um, you know, ultimately, you hope that there are people who are smarter than you. You're, you're not going to be the scope of a general counsel's job is so broad. There's no way for you to be um, the ultimate expert in everything. Um, and there might there might be one particular topic area where you know the most, but um, there are going to be a lot of topic areas where you need to rely on on other people. So for me, um, you know, the idea that you can be the smartest person in the room is is not a good thing. And and then I think on top of it, it's um, not good because um, it actually doesn't um, promote confidence in your own people. I think if they feel like they're working for someone who's always going to try to show that he or she is smarter than them. 
that's just a really, um, I think, a negative, that negative atmosphere and a negative um, mindset that you're creating for your folks. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. Um, uh, let me try one more on you and then we're going to wrap this up. So you spoke earlier about leadership. Um, so what about the statement, leadership and management skills are important, but they're overrated. Just hire great people and you're all set. That I definitely disagree with. Um, you know, I think especially with the what I found, the population of lawyers, um, you know, lawyers are often very smart, um, but um, certainly some of the lawyers that I've hired, um, you know, have needed um, guidance um, in terms of how to develop their, some of these soft skills that I talked about, the interpersonal skills, sort of self-awareness, um, how to lead, um, sort of understanding the culture of a company. Um, and, and I think oftentimes, um, lawyers come in um, having the mindset of wanting to be the smartest people in the room. And then you're in a company, um, you know, you may be smarter than some of the salespeople, but they um, probably know a lot more um, than you about business and strategy. And so, you know, how you work together, um, how you develop productive relationships um, is, is, is really critical. So, um, so I think um, that's where um, management and, and focus on development is, is really important because you sort of bring in people with the raw materials, but I think a lot of people um, need, need um, some guidance and push towards um, developing some of these other skills that are critical to their success. John, you're about to take a uh, step into the next chapter of your life. Um, so as you walk out the door, what's the thing you're going to miss the most about the role that you, you, you've been uh, playing in this company? I think what I'm going to miss the most is um, working with people, both in my department and um, outside of the department. You know, you spend so much time at work. Um, you um, are fortunate um, if it's a situation where you really enjoy the people that you're working with. And I've been fortunate to have a situation where I've enjoyed the people I work with, where um, I like them and I, I um, know that they, they like me as well. Um, I think that um, I've tried to embody a sort of servant leadership um, style of leadership that I think a lot of people at my company um, have gravitated towards and, and try to emulate a little bit. And I think that's a great thing because I think what you really want to do is um, eventually um, develop people, um, develop people who um, you're really proud to see rise up. Um, and, you know, I'll definitely miss all these people, but I think I'll be um, able to stay in touch with them because we have good relations, and which again, I'll miss that. But at the same time, they'll keep me advised of how they're doing. And, and it'll be, I think, great to see from afar how, how, they, how they progress and how they uh, achieve and succeed. Well, and it seems very clear to me that you left the company in great hands uh, with, the, with the way that you've led the team. So congratulations to you. And thank you very much uh, for your time. And with that, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Larry. This was yeah. really a fun conversation. We'll have to uh, do it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you.